And hello, hello, hello again, boys and girls. Welcome back to the channel. It's, of course, your host, Mildly Startled. And today it's another art action report of the United States of America. And unfortunately, this was a rather underwhelming experience because of some of the mechanics in the game, uh, meaning that you could completely avoid the American Civil War. It also became apparent during this playthrough the ease of access of resources in this game and the fact that most of the AI seems rather willing to trade regardless of what you get up to. Uh, this has really sort of shown this sort of apparent issues with the economic system, meaning that because there's so much resources on the map and it's so easy to access them that you end up sort of succeeding in blobbing regardless of what you do as long as you're big enough. But regardless, let's discuss the United States of America, my actions and considerations I made throughout. So the United States of America is a very interesting nation at the start of the game. It's got a fairly small population, a fairly small professional army, and it's still got a lot of territory to colonize as it moves westwards. This means it's fairly vulnerable to early game diplomacy from the major powers, but it has got some benefits. One, it has a very copiously large conscript population of volunteers slash uh, militia, meaning that even though on face value your main army seems rather small, you can whack out hordes of militiamen to the swarm the enemy, which means that if, say, Russia decides to join uh, against your war with Mexico, you can actually just blob until the, uh, the Russians get bored. It also has a lot of resources in the north with coal, iron, and uh, lead, and so on and so forth, which are extremely important for when you begin your westerly expansion. This is very much a nation of expansion westward and also trying to build up the infrastructure. This means the early game is spent mostly expanding west with the small wars, well, apparently small wars on Mexico, before actually having to industrialize, which acts as sort of a speed bump for you as you try and have to build railways with your limited population. Because your population is so limited at the start of the game, a lot of your mid to late games really focused on bolstering your population so you can actually begin to extract a lot of resources. One of the great things about the United States is its copious amount of gold early on in California and other locations. That means you can really extract a lot of wealth to really field your uh, industrial revolution. The big problem is, of course, a lot of that industrial revolution is spent on steel in order to build locomotives, in order to build railways, in order to keep the market access high. And so a lot of your early demand will be in steel and engines. The also big issue is that you don't have access to certain luxury goods such as dye and silk meaning that your clothing and furniture industry will be quite low early on unless you can get imported goods from, say, the, uh, southern, state, uh, the southern South America, or whether or not you can get, get import them abroad or wait until you get artificial dye and artificial uh, silk. So you can play very... You can, you can, there's certain stages within the United States playthrough which involve first westerly expansion, then consolidating the United States, followed by beginning soft diplomacy slash customs union in the south, and eventually you can get to a stage where you just blob out and start doing Pacific colonialism, which eventually I did. So the first thing I found rather underwhelming about the United States experience is the actual civil war mechanics. So you start with a fairly strong southern planter uh, government, uh, which and also a lot of abolitionists. Now, the idea is that if you upset one too much, then you will end up with a civil war. Well, was in, in sort of Victoria 2, it was a bit of a concern because, of course, uh, events would push the Civil War and depending on what the Pops did, you could have a very strong South, full of soldiers or full of industry. But because of the command economy in Victoria 3, you can sort of rig the game in your favour, putting a lot of your industry in the North. And because the government system in Victoria 3 is very binary with past law upset, political group by five or make political group happy plus six it's very easy to balance out and keep both political parties happy before eventual industrialization minimizes the strength of the southern plantation group so in order to avoid the american civil war all i really did was avoid passing laws that would upset the southern planters and then pass or take events that would keep both sides happy before eventually getting enough positive southern plantation happiness and small enough political clout to pass through the abolition of slavery. This meant no civil war occurred, which is a bit disappointing as the United States of America because you had hoped that that would be sort of the big aspect of the game for the United States, being that you would of course try and 
begin your early expansion before having a big old war that may of course lead to a powder keg in Europe and potentially European powers intervening. Sadly this was not the case. I also came across for actually something rather important which I'd forgotten about, which is the decisions tree, which you need to do to map the western frontier. This will eventually allow you to get an event to take the northern territories. Initially I didn't know how to do this, and so it became an early game of sort of trying to blob or hoping I could trade this territory, ending up to a rather deformed uh, United States with a very weird border. Equally, because of the initial conquer state command on the politics tab, so that the first state you do, you ask for on a diplomatic play you have no control of, meaning that the first state in my second war of Mexico was Chihuahua, which I didn't even want. I wanted like I wanted like Arizona, but sadly that was not the case. So early game was of course spent expanding and colonizing the central plains, uh, making sure uh, I could conquer or make sure I got older sort of Indian territory before the rest of, 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 of America did. The next step was of course going to war with Mexico. Now rather irritatingly the Russians decided to join with the Mexicans and so I had to rely on a very large numerous militia population to sort of push in and win the war. This worked out rather well because you can go a very long time in deficit before you go bankrupt and this meant I went basically De default a la civil war style, just printing money um, to win the war, which I did. This led, led to further sort of um, centralization of California and other states, followed by another war with Mexico, which they immediately uh, diplomatically pieced out of, which irritated me because I only got one piece of territory, finally leading to my final war with Mexico, which turned them into a puppet. As you can see here, Mexico's got a little, little star over it, and its, pop and its uh, actual GDP has gone up extremely high. In the north, you had some Bay companies start off very good relations with me, but then decided to have a war of independence with Great Britain, becoming some sort of weird republic in the process. This meant it became independent from Britain, allowing me to easily move in and take it. Of course, the Russians tried to intervene once again, but at that stage I was so economically strong that I was not only was able to force the Hudson Bay Company to become my dominion, or my puppet, I believe it's my puppet actually, I was also able to take Alaska as well, even though you can do it by event. Although, they will do it by decision, even though the decision is quite difficult to do because it needs to have Russia in a debt slash deficit before you can actually ask to buy Alaska. And of course, this is too far late in the game for me to do so. The RNG system of constantly having to uh, do the mapping the west was rather irritating for me because of course you'd fail it once or twice and then of course what would happen is you'd have to redo it when in fact it was just easier at that stage of the game to simply to go to war. Now what I mean about this sort of mid game, the mid game was really once you start colonizing the west it's trying to build up the infrastructure to actually keep the market access in to keep the quality of life high to continue expanding westwards. The big problem again I had with this United States of America was the fact that uh, a lot of my pops weren't particularly well educated and I had to build a lot of universities and of course I had to build a lot of rail lines which meant that I had to put a lot of uh, build a lot of iron which meant I had to build a lot of steel which meant I had to build a lot of locom locomotives. Even now it's still very difficult to keep a high market access but that is mostly due to a lack of peasants or a lack of anyone who can do the work because my population has got to the stage where I simply have no more pops left to actually do any work which is rather amusing. But in order, but because of that rail line system you do start in the early sort of mid game as a fairly weak nation. Really you're the most vulnerable at the start of the game when you're colonizing westwards and in the mid game sort of 1870s, 1890s you're spending this building up your industry, building up your rail lines and trying to keep positive relations with the southern South American states in order to get their luxury goods. So the big limitation was of course the lack of dye plantations and of course the lack of silk, which means that you really were dependent on foreign trade at that stage of the game. But after you really see, reach that critical mass, you then begin of course being able to expand north and south. Now I was able to expand north fairly easily because of course the Hudson Bay Company decided to go independent and so eventually it just came, uh, became a war of Great Britain for this final bit of territory in Newfoundland. However, halfway through I decided to LARP and try and fight a war of liberation for Cuba and Puerto Rico. Now as you can see here there's a little bug where there's still American flags on Cuba even though it's still an independent nation. So in fact it, by fighting the Spanish I was able to push them out and also push. Again this sort of demonstrated the, uh, 
the limitations in the war mechanic because it seems that once you do naval invade a territory, it's very unlikely for the AI to counter naval invade. But regardless of that, eventually we were able to secure Mexico minus Drow, which became ours. And of course, eventually this upset the South American states who then kept on leaving our customs union. What I found very frustrating is that it was very difficult to expand the United States sort of forced political moves because if you were playing soft and doing customs union with these nations, if you ever expanded too much, they would simply leave your customs union. Which of course, early game was quite a hit to the economy, but by mid to late game it was irrelevant because you were so strong and you had artificial dye and artificial silk, it wasn't the end of the world. This of course would eventually lead me to force myself to do for Western diplomacy, or East, uh, yeah, Western for the United States and move into the Pacific. I had hoped to get Japan, a historically sort of uh, ally historically, to join sort of a customs union slash buy my goods. Uh, but at last they joined the Chinese instead and then eventually became a Russian puppet slash Russian customs partner. So eventually this would lead to my wars over Vietnam in order to get hold of some silk and some opium. Now, strangely enough, Greater Qing decided to join that war, but luckily the British were also wanted to intervene. This led to a rather large war of about a million Chinese as headbutting themselves into Hong Kong. This, then I, this, because again, the limitations of the AI, I was able to naval invade Da Nang and begin moving up into sort of a guerrilla warfare, killing about a million Chinese <laughs> before eventually Da Nang surrendered. I did try and invade Burma as well, but at this stage in the game, it was my 250 well-equipped Americans versus 100,000 Chinese soldiers a la North Korea, just rushing down and blocking further advance. And even though I was killing a, a lot of Chinese, uh, soldiers in this, it, I couldn't really advance anymore and so I had to peace out with Da Nang in order to get those resources. This does lead to quite an interesting precedent for, uh, precedence for the United States because although it's got limitations in terms of, sort of the events and that for the Americans for War, it's really quite disappointing. It, it starts off with you heavily expanding, heavily industrializing and then expanding further for special goods. Unfortunately, the AI, I feel right now, just hasn't got a greater grasp of the balance of power. And so it will be quite happy for you to expand westward with maybe one or two miners or one or two majors trying to stop you. And at that stage, you know, because of the, because of the sort of army mechanic and a lack of the ability of those units to garrison the islands of their allies or the uh, territory of their allies before you naval invade, normally you can take the islands and the territory before they can even defend or stop you. Which is a tad disappointing really because sometimes I felt like I should have lost a war but because I could just land over here and they had no garrisons and the thousand Chinese were up north trying to take Hong Kong, it meant I could easily win wars I shouldn't really have been able to do so just by sheer numbers and just by bad uh, bad AI and logic. They should have kept at least a small garrison to stop naval invasions. Still, it was a fairly fun nation to play because of course you have a bit of everything involved. You have a bit of colonization, you have a bit of war, which again is very dependent on whether or not Russia joins and slaps you. You have a bit of soft diplomacy with South America and you have a bit of expansion westwards. So. It was really quite a fun experience uh, playing in South America, although it's very underwhelming right now because of the lack of events and the lack of the civil war. I think the civil war mechanic is just not does not fit in well with the government system of this. In fact, I think the only way you can get an American civil war is if you deliberately ignore the diplomacy, uh, the, the government tab, and just decide to mong it and end up getting sort of blapped. Regardless, I still end up getting to that sort of recession phase halfway through the game. Uh, which came oh, which came to about that slump, if you can just see there. Which then, of course, led to my further expansion into Hudson Bay and Mexico. Of course, the Hudson Bay Company also had an economic issue because they just got saturating goods. You can see here that's when they had their War of Independence in 1901, followed by me eating them, a big boom, followed by collapse once they realised their wood is no longer of any value. We've also got other, country, other countries like the Philippines and so on and Hawaii, but I couldn't remember these, I don't know the historical territories of the United States, and so I probably have more or less stars. And of course, eventually you can expand and take the Panama Canal uh, via decision, and of course, I ended up taking the Suez as well for the extra prestige. Still, I did begin to see the limitations of the economic system in this game, as well as the limitations in the AI in terms of diplomacy, and of course, in um, 
the economy. And so with larger nations, I never really felt like I was having any issues getting hold of supplies. And if I did have any issues, I simply just expanded a market or subjugated and a minor nation to get hold of those supplies to uh, get hold of those special resources. So I think the big thing they need to do is limit the amount of resources available on the markets right now. Uh, I had also, had also hoped to go like an America first sort of approach where I went full isolationist to stop trade with foreign powers. But alas, early on, there's not any really government that, there's not any sort of government or, or party that supports full isolationism. So I couldn't actually go around becoming isolationist. Which is sad, but I understand the logic, you know, being America and a, and a free trade nation. But apart from that, it's a pretty standard uh, standard approach to the United States of America. Um, and because of the nature of its location, it has a pretty much a free reign to expand at will, potentially into South America or potentially what I did and just take the whole northern continent. Anyway, let's talk about our GDP and so on and so forth and our industry and then that will be that. So first things first is of course our domestic product. You can see that it's very stagnant at the start. It only really starts to boom towards sort of the end of the game and that reason is because a lot of your early game is the speed bump of actually colonizing and industrializing the United States of America. Once you do get the railway set up, once you do get the market access ready and you do begin to develop uh, your existing industry of research and so on, your uh, your economy does ex immediately explode because you have everything you need apart from those few special resources of silk and rubber and uh, dye. But uh, at that stage, towards the end of the game, you can make artificial versions of it. So you're pretty much uh, living the dream. Of course, literacy is quite an important one. But again, uh, at sort of the middle of the game, I had to sort of cut back on spending because of... Um, the many wars I was having uh, and so I had to, uh, you can see my literature never, never got really high enough. And of course the quality of life just begins to boom um, just by filling all the demands and the United States of America can quite easily fill basic demands for most of its pops unless of course you need to uh, get more clothing or get some more sort of special furniture and stuff like that. The big limitation for America, for America for its growth is its population. It's a very, it very much is a migrant focused population where you need to sort of endorse or promote migration in order to actually get enough people in to actually do the jobs. Uh, eventually you'll get to the mid to late game where you simply haven't got enough people left to do any of the work and so you're sort of scuppered. Um, you can't really expand any further and that's when you probably got to expand into foreign markets uh, just to keep your economy going up. Uh, there's ways to actually go about this. So I ended up building, I believe, the Statue of Liberty, which gives you a plus 25% colonial boost. And also, if you can keep the literati or the intelligentsia happy, they give you a plus 100% migration attraction. So by mid to late game, if you can keep the intelligentsia in, in good check, you can end up with a massive migrant boost, as you can see here. I've got lots of people coming in, and they're all coming in en masse, meaning that, of course, uh, eventually my population will be up high enough to begin signing out more workers. As long as you keep the quality of life happy and the intelligence are happier, you should be okay to keep on uh, expanding and building up your industries. Of course, the radicals were always up and down depending on the situation. Um, I could, of course, lower taxes for a while and keep the radicals happy, but a lot of it came from market access simply because of... Um, the inability, inability to build enough railroads because of the lack of steel and locomotives and also because there was not enough people trained and qualified to use or actually who were in the state to maintain the railroads which meant that a lot of times radical was high. Especially early mid-game once you had sort of reformed the government I ended up with a super a sort of a mega blog a uh, block of, uh, of of different political groups in my nation, which uh, initially were quite difficult to actually handle because uh, rather amusingly, I went with women's suffrage quite early on. And this upset the, <laughs> this upset most of my party. And so what I had to do is go back to women in the world, uh, back to propertied women and women <laughs> in, <laughs> until like until the 1900s and the suffragettes kicked off, then go back over to women's suffrage, which is a uh, but I got multicultural fairly early, and of course I banned slavery pretty early as well, around about 1860, because of course by that stage the industrialization had the industrialists had taken over and the seven planters had stopped becoming a very important part. 
Of course, if you want to LARP, you could just become a plantation state, although you would struggle, I suspect, to maintain that in the long game because you'll be effectively, you won't have enough of the luxury resources to sort of stay profitable and continue expanding. And at the same time, you'll be denying uh, growth of industries in the north, which are mostly industrialist based. So there is a room for an alt history confederate playthrough, but you're going to be gimping yourself by, by simply not having the resources or the, rural, the sort of the luxury goods in order to achieve that. Uh, Bioxies have got high for a while because I've simply not played around with it properly. Um, this is probably the hardest it's been in a while, but I've I just stopped playing after the stage because I pretty much won the game. Uh, again, same thing with authority. I do believe they need to add some more damage to having low authority or potentially if you get low enough to have your certain abilities removed because I've had this the entire game with low authority and it's never been taken away from me. Diplomacy was a pretty important one for a while, trying to keep all these uh, customs unions happy. I, I did go through a phase with having all of South America in my customs union, which was quite the, was the house in days. But as soon as I began expanding into Mexico and Hudson Bay, my infamy got far too high and they no longer wanted to play with me. And so I ended up, but at that stage, I would had entirely the north, which had a massive population. Uh, actually, it doesn't. It's got a very small population. I had that and Mexico, and and I had and I didn't really need these guys anymore because I was expanding westwards. I would have liked to have kept a customs union, but uh, I feel right now infamy is not as bad as it should be. Um, I think Vicky Two version, if you got infamy high enough, the entire world came to clap your cheeks, was a lot more interesting because limited and made you more clever about what you did. Uh, whereas the infamy here, maybe they give you the odd embargo, maybe they stop wanting to join your customs union, but and maybe you get Belgium once in a while demanding or trying to cut you down to size. But again, the limitations of the warfare system means as long as I mobilise most of my troops when they try and do a landing, uh, they won't get a foothold in America, and so I can more or less ignore any sort of cut down to sizes. I believe the infamy system may need to rework, perhaps double or treble the radicals. And another thing I think they should rework is the number of radicals you need before a civil war occurs or greater damage to uh, your uh, economy when you have more radicals. Because right now you can have very high radicals and very low loyalists and simply not care. Uh, this is some minor balancing. Again, models will be able to fix it. Uh, and of course, in the access of resources, the models will be able to fix that as well. But uh, it's just things to consider because it did feel like once you got the base challenges of the nation done uh, as a major, it felt like any other real major, this was some slight issue uh, necessary for expansion westward. It'd be an interesting game to play for multiplayer because, of course, it, you will have more stops and checks, but in single player, it's a tad more limited. So if we look at our politics, we can see that I, I tried to stay as uh, true to the American system as possible. So I did was able to introduce multiculturalism fairly early. Uh, I kept cultural separation and kept most of these. One of the big struggles I had early on was trying to go for professional army because a lot of the political parties did not like that, uh, going away from national militia. However, I was eventually able to, to do that and uh, of course I improved my army considerably. I did not really change the economic system here, nor did I really change the uh, trade policy as well. I had hoped to get isolationism, but there was no political parties that really supported such a decision because I did want to go for America first, uh, complete isolationism from foreign markets, but alas, I could not pull that off. Uh, proportional taxation was obviously a thing to go down because, of course, that was where most of the money was because I was becoming an industrialized state. Uh, and of course the middle class and the lower class were getting a better quality of life. I would like to see what a playthrough of consumption-based taxation would be like. I assume you'd be end up being a nation with not a lot of resources uh, and having to sort of import those resources and getting a tax cut of those resources instead of making your own. But as the big problem right now is that pretty much the, the, the world is overloaded with luxury resources and overloaded with, with, with resources full stop, there isn't really a need to go into that sort of uh, economic system of um, of an import uh, of of an import tariff reliant nation. 
And of course, you had women's suffrage. I already told you about the amusing step where I, where I became liberal too early and it upset most of the liberal bloc. I had to had to revert. Now, I don't think it's, in real life that would have worked. Simply, I mean, already they still want property women as, as, as opposed to women's suffrage. They still want that compared to... Now, still, I don't think in real life that would work. You would give an entire, half your population equal rights and then uh, 10 years later say okay we're taking it back i think you'd have massive radicalization but hey ho it's just one of those things i'm not going to question it i did do a bit of welfare i know america doesn't do welfare but i thought they'd do like you know food stamps and stuff like that so i did do some poor laws and i did care police were uh, forced to larp as the fbi you know the growing uh, sort of j edgar hoover sort of gate public schools and of course the private health service to again larp of course i probably could push through public health care but uh we are uh, we were trying to larp we did do a bit of regularly bodies like for teamsters and so on um and i did notice i there's a distinct lack of events for the united states of america there's no events for uh there's very limited events for the american civil war and there's very limited events for, say, the Great Depression. I think that should be in the game as, a, as a sort of an artificial penalty for the United States. Um, or just for the whole country, a whole world. Like, imagine if the whole world after a certain date has got hit with the Great Depression and all the economies just, like, plummeted. And that would, that would be an interesting mechanic to see how well that turned out. And uh, But alas, you, get, you don't get any of that. You get a few events up here which are very difficult to pull off and you can basically ignore and just go to war <laughs> instead. Uh, and of course you get a few events with the Suez and Panama Canal but there's nothing really there to sort of immerse you in that nation which i think is very disappointing from paradox like you think united states is one of the key points had one of the most sort of key aspects in terms of their civil war in europe at this stage and yet there's just not a lot of flavor not a lot of actual challenge in dealing with the civil war the fact is 1860s to 1865 sort of american civil war was a massive thing uh, for the americans and of course a massive thing potentially historically with the potential for britain or france to intervene uh, but you don't see any of that in the game um and it's just a, and it's very binary in how you deal with it which i think is very disappointing but uh anyway so it, it is what it is so if we look at our taxation i did go from up high to up low just depending on what i needed and of course as soon as the game starts i immediately go with these consum as many consumption taxes as possible because i know i can keep them throughout the game and eventually they'll get bigger and bigger of course, once they get to a certain size, it costs a whole lot more um, authority to actually institute them. So it's best to institute them early and then continue to make more and more money off them and institute them late and only institute one or two. You can see I'm making 718k, which again is, I think, an issue with your authority system. Instead of just going, I think they need to, to fix that and to say after you go below a certain authority, you either get massive penalties or massive rise in radicalization or you end up having some of your uh, special abilities like consumption taxes taken away from you. Of course, construction was going up and down. In the end, I, I kept it low because I simply had no more pops left to actually build anything. And government wages are kept high to keep the literati happy or the intelligentsia happy so they would come over and give me more immigration. Military wages were very uh, situational. I, I kept it low when I could to keep, uh, but not low enough that I would get a penalty to military upkeep. And as soon as a war started, I whacked up high to get the bonuses to my damage. Like, another thing I've noted is the economic system is that when you go to war, you can go into deficit like full red and it will just go full red and come off a bit and full red and come off a bit, meaning that you can maintain a war almost indefinitely during... Um, during wartime. I don't know if that's a feature, uh, but I, I, I should have gone bankrupt with that war of Mexico when Russia joined in, but I didn't, so hey-ho. Uh, that's a thing they need to take into account. Of course, our wealthier states, uh, our states where most expensive is New York, and the states coming getting the most taxes is New York as well, because of course that's also a high population, and it still is a high population for me. Uh, unfortunately so high that I'm actually beginning to lose taxation off it. At this stage, I just stopped looking at states and turmoil. There's nothing I could do about it. So I was like, you know what? Just stop looking at it. Subsidize the railroads. And eventually uh, that will sort itself out. And assets, you can see we're still in the red, but we always are in this game with a maximum credit of 184 million, which you could probably get higher. I mean, growth has not stopped. We had a little recession, when I was, which oddly enough occurred when I lowered taxes, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's all gone back to normal, so it's okay. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is when I came off low taxes because of my deficit getting too high, and the quality of life has now plateaued. 
of course our industry it was a bit of everything uh food industry uh clothes industry when eventually i got artificial dye furniture when i got uh, again artificial stuff as well uh no actually furniture was fine it's, it's mostly clothing because luxury clothing was very difficult to get as america because i couldn't get hold of silk which was a bit of frustrating Again, the one thing, good thing about America late game, or one of the good things, is that it has a lot of oil. Not enough to just for you to go full on oil production for everything, but enough that you can build a lot of, um, you can you can really minimize it. So instead of going for this whole glass industry, I can just go for bits of this glass industry instead. There we are. And that means you can really jump ahead of production for the for america when compared to other powers because you've got so much oil especially if you do get mexico under your wing because of course with mexico under your wing you can also get a lovely lovely dose of oil you became really much the oil epicenter of, of the world meaning that late game you do pop off very quickly tools of course are always a necessity because again i'm what i tend to find is the optimum strat if you're playing a major is to be self-contained and just to build up your industry to be self-sustainable of course you could become hyper specialized but as the united states you don't really have a lot of other nations or a lot of other colonies to um, support so it's very more important to say you sustain yourself and so most of the uh, tools industry was self-sustaining for my own industry of course Pretty much everything was more or less the same for this, um, just trying to be as self-sustaining as possible. Eventually building synthetic plants to actually meet my clothing quotas and meet my uh, silk quotas, because of course at some stage you can make synthetic silk as well. And most of it was steel and locomotives. You can see here a massive investment in steel and locomotives. You really are a nation dependent on your steel industry, which you can see now the logic behind it, because of course, you're, in, in order to build this railroad empire, you needed all that steel. So you can understand why so much steel was, uh, so much steel production was made in America. And of course, a large amount of engines to fulfill all the sort of market access needs. War planes were pretty self-explanatory as well. Uh, I was able to get hold of some rubber somewhere. I don't know where actually, but I'll check later. And of course, power plants, you can eventually become very electrolified because you do get oil fired plants at some stage. Again, you can't mass it and just go, ah, oh, let's all turn it to oil because it becomes too expensive. But you can turn one or two to oil. And then after you've done that, you can, of course, make a nice, nice little profit. Of course, we had government industries. I tried to build one government industry in at least every single uh, location. Um, just so the bureaucrats would have a job and I built up the universities as well. So people would be qualified enough to do a job. I got a few, uh, we built our skyscraper in the end, which you do via the decision tab, which then unlocks it for you to build. And uh, of course, we got the good old Statue of Liberty and the White House. Now, the Statue of Liberty was lovely because, of course, it gave you that extra 25% migration attraction, which you need. Really, migrate. you are a very migration-dependent nation. Of course, for some strange reason, I had an awful lot of grain. I think it was because of the maize farms. In fact, one of the things USA has got a lot of is grain. And so early on, it was a case of just turn all the grain into wine because I can. I don't know if I became the top producer of wine. Uh, let's take a look, shall we? Yeah, number one producer. Like I said, wine is the liqueur of, uh, of, of Victoria Free. And of course, a very heavy coal and iron industry, really just basically heavy metals for everything and gold because you make so much money from gold. It's ridiculous. Like gold is is ample for the United States. There are some luxury goods you can get hold of, uh, such as Hawaii. Uh, this I got hold of this because I was trying to relieve the Philippines and that with this state. American Panama and of course, Puerto Rico. Uh, which which means that if you do act very aggressively or do actually try and play somewhat historically, you can get a hold of some of these raw resources. Cotton, of course, you do have plenty of cotton, but unfortunately, it's not the main. It's not one of the only sources of fabric. Really, cotton should probably be one of its own resources because I just build a load of ranches instead and just make a load of fiber that way. I was able to get hold of some dye because I was able to take Chihuahua by accident, which uh, meant that this did offshoot my early demand. And of course, I was able to get some tea from Hawaii as well. Tobacco is one of the extra res uh, surplus resources you do have access to, as well as sugar, so you don't really have to worry about those. And bananas, again, you don't really have to worry about them because your wheat farms can make fruit. 
logging was quite important but once i did in sort of incorporate uh, uh canada into my nation it really just get uh, the wood no longer became an issue and because of course i've got so much so much electricity i could just mass produce uh wood at my own desire and rubber was also something i was able to get hold of but uh again puerto rico america again not particularly large quantities so one other thing you're limited on unless you do try and colonize uh africa as well but good luck doing that in a uh, multiplayer game but the great thing is the oil you can make so much oil uh is the united states that uh, you can get some real big bonuses late game which other nations can't especially to your military so of course we can go mechanized if you want but i just kept it on squad because i wasn't fighting it was at that stage and because your later stuff does require oil and does require airplanes you do end up becoming a rather strong military nation towards the end of the game i found it quite interesting playing the united states being that initially you start a fairly small army you do keep a fairly small army that's out of necessity but as the game continues you do begin to blob up and do become rather excessive i did come across a bug doing map the west where if you do a map the west and fail your one of you your general stays permanently mapping the west and so i couldn't use about initially a hundred of my men but now i can't use 64 of my battalions because of that bug so that made wars a bit more frustrating and of course, our rail lines 507. At some places, I did go electric, and some places, I did, of course, go public traded. But um, really, sometimes you build railroads, but you can't do anything about it because there's not enough people that are qualified to work in that state. And then, of course, you would need to build a university, and then you end up with a, a sort of a turmoil death loop. Uh, and it, but eventually, it sorts itself out because of America's migration. So sometimes, even uh, sometimes building more railroads just won't fix the problem. You just got to wait for more pops to turn up and just make sure you substart your railroads, and then hopefully that will fix the problem. So trade, if you take a look at our trade tab, our services were pennies, like because our states are so great. Again, I did almost no investment in grain and I'm still in a pretty good spot. And of course, wood, again, I'm still pretty good spot, especially with mercury. And it's still a little bit expensive, but I can fix that. And of course, transportation, because of our massive rail lines, pretty easy. Clothing was still a bit of a low deficit, but you can see most of this is balanced apart from fabric. But again, this is an easy fix for me and nothing I have to worry about too much. America late to mid game does not struggle at all, apart from clo uh, fancy clothing and a little bit of... Ooh, da, 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 da. really just fancy clothing if i'm honest with you of course none of these were an issue uh again as a major nation access to these real resources were never particularly difficult um so you could you could build a massive surplus you can see here i've got massive surpluses and all, all of this if, if there was a bit of a death loop here where it was build iron to make steel to make engines to make railroads to make iron to make steel <laughs> and so uh, early game you do end up with sort of a loop of doing the same thing over and over until you get enough research to uh m to get extra bonuses to this but uh nothing too shabby still still remained a problem um even then i could still i could make more artificial silk industries but mid to early to even mid late game until you get artificial silk you will be struggling to get hold of that finer finer things in life <laughs> And rubber as well becoming more expensive. Again, customs unions can fix that, but if you are going to expand like I did, good luck trying to stay in a customs union. Oh yeah, and of course our luxury goods. So our big limiting issue for luxury goods was in fact luxury clothing, because these actually require silk to make, and so uh, a lot of my high uh, higher level pops weren't getting their demands met, the uh, upper strata. Again, importing fixed that a little bit, but it still was a bit disappointing. Wine, which is literally Vicky free liqueur because no one makes it. <laughs> I could mass produce this and make a killing off it, but of course it would change my demographic. Uh, but it wasn't a problem. Coffee was also wasn't, wasn't a problem, uh, but tea was and um, where else? Uh, tea and there was something else I was a nightmare to get hold of opium opium was an absolute nightmare to get hold of uh, but that again can be fixed by expanding westwards and then your army like you can see here because you've got such a heavy industry that you, all your early stuff your ironclads your guns your ammunition 
you could become the arms producer of the world if you wanted to but i wouldn't recommend it because of course it uh, really demand for weapons and ammunition that comes from the amount of troops an army is fielding so if you're if you're, the world is, is dealing with smallish armies and you just mass produce guns and that if no one's dealing with massive armies then of course there'll be no demand for it but still it's a nice thing to take into account that you can become the gun producer of the world if you so choose this is where I'm starting to see a big issue with the resource or the ample access to resources or the limited of uh, limited diversity of resources because as a major you can pretty much fill all these voids up and if you don't you just expand or, or, or add to a custom union and minor nation that can and so it became a case of you know build build tools oh and now I need to build wood build tools, build iron, build coal, build wood, build tools, build iron, build coal, build steel, build engines. Okay, and is, that, is that all my uh, market access done? Okay, what else do I need? Oh, I'll just build that. Okay, what else do I need? I'll just do build that. Oh, I need more tools, build more tools, build more iron, build, build more wood. And you end up just doing this loop. And that means, of course, for a major nation, you sort of expect that, especially the United States, because it is a resource ample. But you do need some sort of resource scarcity at some stage. Uh, and of course, there was some resource scarcity. There was resource scarcity in opium and um, rubber. But the ease of accessing that, especially in the game, because the AI is generally rather passive. I mean, I play it on normal difficulty, but the AI is generally so passive that um, they, it will never really try and stop you. You think that it, as soon as they see America coming over or sniffing over here, that you know. The, you'd have china you have, you'd have uh, australia you'd have belgium all coming in and they would be garrisoning the, garrisoning the hell out of uh of vietnam but alas that does not occur because of the uh, the warfare mechanic really warfare mechanic should allow for you to garrison friendly ai territory not only just your own otherwise they just sit there watching my 20 battalions land this undefended island and the war score ticks down which is a bit a uh, bit bleh. But um, yeah, uh, resource scarcity should be more of a thing um, in Victoria 3 because then it creates a greater, uh, what do you call it, create a back and forth between nations. Like I shouldn't need to just take uh, take Puerto Rico to f f fill my coffee needs for the next 20 years. It should be maybe Haiti will give me five coffee plantations. No, um, Puerto Rico might, might give me five coffee plantations, not and not 20. Um, but hey, ho, that's, you know, that's, that is what it is. Uh, and then of course our military, again nothing really to talk about apart from the military bug and a uh, pretty standard approach really. Uh, our diplomacy, again once I became massive expansion, uh, expansion uh, lunatic, uh, no one wanted to talk to me anymore, join my customs union, which is a trade-off. Sometimes I feel like it's better with the, with the army mechanic just to blob and force dominions because then that way they never leave your customs union. So I perhaps shouldn't have just, I shouldn't have let these guys go and just sort of force my will upon them, but I didn't want to blob too much if you know what I mean. Technology, we were a bit behind uh, with little bits and bobs. Um, like towards the end of the game because I just couldn't be bothered to make tanks but it looks like it researched for me and in our cultures of course we had a large Yankee population a large Dixie, a large Mexican population obviously a large North German population and Filipino Afro-American which is only 0.9% of the population which is a, a tad odd but uh, hey ho and of course English, French, Anglo-Canadian, Scottish and so on and so forth then our population ourselves, pretty expensive levels of basic requirements right now. Um, I suspect because it's probably market access. Uh, but um, what was actually spending most of its money on? Wine, coffee, probably clothes, clothes. And then, yeah, if you want to meet a demand in the United States, build clothes. Um, wine again luxury furniture yeah some of the luxury stuff so i feel like sometimes america it does struggle a little bit trying to get the luxuries out uh but it does have such a heavy industry that it can sort of overcome that 
yeah, these are still fairly expensive, like 22% of expenditures on luxury furniture. Again, quite difficult to achieve because of this uh, resource demand. But I never felt like it would have been difficult for me to avoid having a civil war. I just lower taxes, import stuff, or worst case scenario, just declare war on these poor bastards and uh, force my will upon them. Uh, and then that way that would fix the problem, which I think the AI needs to be better at limiting a, the player's strength and realizing, hey, wait a second, this guy's a lobbing too hard maybe we should form a coalition against them i'll try a hard, a hard difficulty next time but we'll see and of course so we look down here yankee dixie is of course of a large population mexican afro-american english and then we've got a load of different migrants uh, spanish welsh filipino because of course we are a migrant population oh let's take a look at our political clout as well Yep, so the, the literati, of course, got a massive clout because universities were everywhere. The trade unionists, because it's quite industrialised, the industrialists, because it's quite industrialised, and the armed forces, because we've got an army. Uh, petite bourgeoisie, these guys just turned up towards the end of the game. They're supposed to be a fascist, but uh, they didn't really do much. I, I, I feel like sometimes, I feel like the big limitations of the political system is that a vote of a political party is like you think a radical political party, even though it's a, it has a, a, low, a small amount of political clout, would do more damage. So if you think about like the Silver Legion, you you you, you would think that it would be a small part of the population, but it would do a lot of damage uh, with its small population. It would be more prone to revolts and sort of anarchist behaviour. Uh, it didn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't need to be a massive. Um, a massive party to do something because it's a radical sort of party uh, whereas of course a more progressive party like the intelligentsia would need a larger population before it did anything like extremist groups really right now there's no real extremist groups in um in vicky free like you like the extremist group won't become extremist until it's got a, it's, it, it's no longer extremist and it's part of the majority then things start going horribly wrong uh, and even then they'll only get upset if they're no longer happy i feel like uh, vicky too could do with um extremist political group organizations that would hopefully flesh out the game and you'd have to be go around dealing with or limiting their power uh otherwise they would just sort of use terror tactics or just uh, begin to progressively sort of sabotage your nation from within as a small demographic within your nation but alas that's just wishful thinking hopefully we'll see that later on because you'd think you know small population a bit like the seven planters if i you know, de declared the abolition of slavery, it wouldn't matter how much of a percentage of political clout they'd have. If they were like 10% of the population, they were still going to have a civil war. So again, political clout and radicalism are two separate things. I feel like you should have a ranking for that political group in terms of how radical it is and also how much political power it has. The more political power it has, of course, the more damage or more dangerous it will become. Whereas uh, its radicalism will be, mean how often it does something dangerous, like I don't know, an event to sabotage industry or an event to sabotage a state or something like that. It doesn't have to be anything too hands-on. There's things that will begin to irritate you until you eventually stamp it out or uh, normalise it uh, via decisions or via sort of different manner and bits and bobs. But hey-ho, it is what it is. It is what it is. I think the more I play, I do start seeing more of the limitations in the game. Um, journal um i did want to go for hold a grand exhibition but i never got around to it i never clicking this button ever again because i'm stuck with uh alexander hyman permanently stuck uh exploring the west and we've done a few things here but nothing too important so let's break down our demographics so if we take a look at our Ooh, I think it is our population. So if we go to our population tab, you can see here our large population. So we've got 7.8, 7.18 million over here, which is almost 10% of our population. And we've got 5.8 million in California. And then we've got a spattering. You can see here it's very difficult, especially in some of these states, to actually get anyone to work in them, what actually live in them. So Utah's got no one in. It's literally like literally flyover states. Uh, so if we take a look at New York. See, we've got 7.18 million. Everyone's quite happy. Uh, GD, like, the standard of living is high. There's, there's, there's no real issues because the market access is good everywhere. And our population is, of course, different cultures, but mostly Yankee, Dixie, Filipino, Spanish, and Central American. Then over on the West Coast, we have got, again, Yankee, 
Brazilian, South Andean, Hokan, Anglo-Canadian, Mexican, North German, and Dixie. Oh, and that could also be a thing to do with the political system. It's based on your, and uh, not only just the radicalization of a political party, but also the population. Um, so if there's a political party that a certain culture uh, supported, like, oh no, as a southern planters, a lot of the Dixie guys supported them. If they became a majority in a certain state, maybe that state would start kicking off or they would start, uh, uh, perhaps they would start to uh, become independent and you'd have to crush it and stop them seceding. There's little things like that, you know, just like, like then it, that, that could simulate the, uh, the sort of slavery uh, race into Kansas and so on and so forth. Because, uh, yeah, that would be quite an interesting thing. But again, that's something for the modders or the uh, paradox developers to sort out. And then let's pick a random state in the center. Let's pick Texas. Why not? Uh, lovely. Dixie. So this is a good example. If there's a large uh, Dixie population that was that described to the radical group, then, of course, Texas should be in high turmoil and generally be unproductive and uh, until you've either reduced that level of population via naughty ways or whether or not you've um, sort of pacified it using uh, political investment or things like that or just improved, not really improved the standard of living because a radical group won't care about the standard of living but um, I suppose if you increase institutions and use decrees which again right now decrees right now are just my tax revenue but if you had to use a certain decree to reduce um, the radicalization of a population in a state um, that would work as well but again that's wishful thinking and so again we've got mexican which is obvious french afro-american filipino and of course in our world rankings we have got united states obviously at the top because i've just blobbed once again into america followed by great britain and i'll tell you what happens to the french later so this game was very much the workers' uh, workers' revolution game. Uh, a lot of the American states, or well, a lot of uh, European states, and a lot of its dominions decided to become workers' revolutionary councils or to become independent. So you can see here the trade unions took over by the uh, Hudson Bay Company, and they forced independence from the Dominion uh, from the United Kingdom, which then allowed me to eat them and. And so they became a bit of a, a rogue rogue dog. Mexico got puppeted early, so it didn't really do much. But really, Europe is where the mess became. So you might be wondering, why is French red? It's because it literally went red. <laughs> it became a red state uh, led by a strong-willed feminist uh, as part of the trade union, uh, loved by a population and unfortunately no longer, I don't think, a major power. Uh, oh, it's still a major power, but no longer a great power. For some strange reason, Occitania always ends up becoming some sort of an independent unit in France. But uh, the French communist system truly expanded into a world of its own. Uh, Spain did have a civil war, but nothing to worry about. And uh, Prussia has been literally cucked out of forming Germany because of, there's a one-state civil war going on. And as we know, the one-state civil war bug, and there's no soldiers in each state and so no one can win the war. So Prussia has literally not been able to form Germany, which is uh, ultra sad. Of course, we have got the absolute empire of uh, the Italians who haven't actually formed Italy yet. And Austria somehow imploded. I think it was because of a war with Russia uh, and Prussia, which then lost some of its territory, uh, eventually becoming uh, what's left of the Kaiserreich under, as a major power. And of course, Hungary becoming independent with some of the southern states. The Ottomans also had a civil war and have got a new ruler in charge of a constitutional empire, which is a bit weird, but they've abolished slavery and uh, Egypt is still existing, uh, even though they're still upset. And of course, Africa just looks disgusting because you've got red, red and uh, a little bit of triple chain in that. I really feel like the Ottoman system needs to be fixed a bit more. Maybe to get the war, the game should start with the Ottomans at war with Egypt, with France and Britain on their side, uh, because right now it just seems like the Ottomans are always getting clapped and they never really do anything and they never really have a chance. And you never really see the balkanization of, of the Ottoman Empire either. 
Russia seems almost the most stable in most of my games because I've never seen it revolt or have any revolutions. You think because of its strong surf population it may actually revolt or do some naughty things but actually it doesn't do anything. <laughs> it just sort of blobs and uh, it gets a very good GDP and then no one really sort of... I mean, it's serfdom, it's like, the serfdom's not even abolished, it's 1931. And so that's the thing I'm sort of trying to get at, is that uh, right now there's no sort of radicalization. Like, there is radicalization, but there's no, it's a very simplistic system. Basically, if you keep the standard of living high and you keep most of the political parties neutral or happy, you'll never have a civil war or never have real, a proper turmoil. Um, and even then you can keep this very high and as long as most of your political parties are happy you're not going to have any issues. I think they need to really make this more complex, uh, the radical system, or make it more unforgiving because if they don't then it's just a case of, well, ignore it or just make sure everyone's neutral or happy in, in the politics tab. I've had one or two cases of bad turmoil but nothing I couldn't fix just by lowering taxes. Uh, but uh, it's just another little thing. I, I do think they, there's, they, they've got room in their current system to flesh it out. They have got room to make that sort of what I was talking about, those sort of radical minority political groups that can, of course, cause unrest uh, the longer certain, uh, certain demands aren't met or uh, the longer they're not pacified, the longer their standard of living is low, uh, or the longer they haven't like assimilated into the culture yet. But um, right now, as it stands, it's just keep this neutral or keep them happy, and uh, never really have a proper war. Um, anyway, uh, in short, uh, this is what Europe looks like now. Enjoy it. This is what peak Europe looks like. Um, I truly is a masterwork of of border gore, uh, but again. I think it would be easy to fix. And then, of course, our final ticket will be back over here to just look at South America. Again, not a lot, not a lot of change. I mean, Chile now exists. I don't think it's a puppet of anything. It's just Chile. Uh, just Chile down there. And we've got a lot of states. Now, Colombia collapsed. Haiti somehow expanded over here. I don't know how or why, uh, but it has. So we must appreciate Haiti for what it is. And of course, we have our lovely little Central American HQ and our Suez Canal. Again, this just gives you prestige, uh, Panama Canal. But this just gives you prestige. It doesn't give you like economic power or anything like that, which is a bit disappointing as well, because you would hope that you would get something more out of having owning both one of the major trade routes. You'd think you'd get like a tariff for when convoys use your route or something like that, because then it would make it more important and add more political pressure into the game about who owns the sort of canals. But uh, alas, that is another bit of wishful thinking. And of course, we've got some of the United Kingdom uh, hanging around over here, being a bit of a nuisance to me. Uh, oh, they've gone communist. Yeah, see a Dominion. But again, I, this would be normally when a world war would hopefully kick off if the game eventually gets fixed or updated a bit more. Uh, and then, of course, I sort of stop, start blobbing down south, and you've got the Windward Islands owned by Great Britain. So, to take a final look. Prussia is actually one of the better powers, followed by Russia, Belgium. Uh, actually, take a look. Uh, there we are. Yeah, Prussia, Russia, Italy, Hungary, Spain. Uh, Spain is a great power. Uh, says a lot about how the rest of the nations did. Uh, yeah, France really just screwed the pooch on that one. Uh, so I don't really understand how these nations are collapsing, but I'm not. I know it's AI, you know, low AI, but like, they, like it's, you know, the AI is intelligent enough to build properly. I just, I just don't think it does any reforms. That's what I think. I think. Um, the AI refuses to reform, as you saw with Russia. And what happens is, because uh, they refuse to reform, they end up having big old civil wars, uh, which then causes them to collapse. I think probably they should be a bit more randomised in how they act in terms of the reform process, rather than just be like, lol, no, let's have a war until I die. Oh, my God, I hate this flag. I absolutely hate it. Um... Uh, and then, of course, you've got your miners like Austria. Really, it was a pretty a slam dunk game. <laughs> Once France is out of the picture, it was a slam dunk game. Uh, even then, France was quite nice to me. It wanted to ally early on, so I was quite a happy boy. In short, what do I think about United States of America? A generally underwhelming experience, um, simply because a lot of the historical flavour for the United States is simply not there. Uh, I think you can say the same for most other nations, uh, but I think the limitations of the political system means that the civil war is very, uh, um, not, well, it's very civil actually, because there's no actual war. The civil war is not a war. It's extremely civil and it isn't a war. It's just a case of keep, uh, keep, keep southern planters in green, go with abolish serfdom. 
ends uh, and ends end quote unquote civil war. Um, but it's an interesting nation that involves heavy industrialization, colonialization, and then of course um, the expanding of infrastructure. And then of course you have lots of different options in the United States, whether or not to begin your sort of uh, soft diplomacy with the Monroe sort of doctrine down south in South America, or whether or not you try and expand the West uh, and begin economic imperialism in Asia to get hold of some of those rare resources. It's also the nation that you do start to see the big limitations of the game come out. Uh, the limitation in terms of the flavor, limitations in terms of the warfare, meaning that I can be at war with half the nation, half the world, but as long as I mobilize when they try and naval invade, they never can naval invade. Uh, and of course, um, what else? Uh, and of course, the limitations in the economy. I think really right now they have too much of a resource surplus, uh, and I think they have a lack of a amount of resource uh, amount of resources available. I don't know how many resources Victoria Two had. Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, like they had cement and things like that. Potentially they need to do the same and add more resources to the game to make it harder for major nations to just be able to do everything. Because right now I can more or less do it. It, it takes me a while to get a, a good balance, but and because the population is always growing, that uh, it means that the balance always shifts. But most of the time I can become become very self sustainable and just begin to explode just by being being self sustainable. Uh, so I think a few more important strategic resources need to be on the map. Uh, which will hopefully lead to more political plays. And of course, the AI needs to be improved in terms of keeping the balance of power. If they see the United States of America go for Hudson Bay and Mexico, most of the world, or well, maybe not the USA, but if, if, if I was, say, Italy and I start blobbing in pretty much the entire of the Mediterranean, then hopefully you'd think the rest of the world would take notice. And that's what I think with um, the infamy system, it needs to be more damaging. So the United States is an interesting nation with a lot of different stages throughout, but uh, it also shows the great limitations, and I can see why a lot of Americans aren't happy with the current iteration of the United States. Uh, there were some interesting things like the railroad system, which made me appreciate why you had these, what do you call it, uh, titans of industry, or you, how you had these railroad magnets, because you didn't realize how important railroads were until I played this game, um, simply because, of course, if you didn't have access, then, of course, you couldn't actually industrialized the United States and it's a game about migration and really just popping off later into the game you start off vulnerable begin become more established watch as the, as the, the power shifts in Europe before eventually becoming one of the sort of power brokers if you so choose and there's a lot of options for you um, whether or not you want to unite North America or whether or not you want to do a bit of Western imperialism, uh, or whether or not you want to get involved in Europe, or you just want to sort of begin your Monroe Doctrine set down south. Uh, so it's a fun nation. Uh, I would say it's more of a beginner nation, uh, with the exception with the potential to get screwed over with Mexico because of lol Russia wants to join. But uh, I would highly recommend giving it a go later on in the game's life cycle. Right now the United States would be a bit of a disappointment for most people because it doesn't really have anything that makes that sets it apart, apart from the other major nations. It hasn't got the intrigues of Europe to worry about. It hasn't got um, the sort of massive customs union relationship Britain has. It hasn't got the French rise of power or the Prussian unif uh, uniforming of uh, of, of Germany or the Russian preservation of uh, the absolute monarchy. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 I'd treat this like, I don't know, playing New Zealand in, uh, in Hoi 4. It's out of the way. No one's going to bother you. Uh, and what you really do, uh, what you do achieve isn't really worth paying much attention to uh, unless you decide to become a nuisance. And that's entirely up to you. I would give up a good nation to uh, develop, uh, to un understand most of the mechanics of the game, uh, but it has some issues with uh, flavor, uh, the AI limitations, and the resource uh, market system. That means that you will pretty much be doing the same thing over and over and over for most of the game with little to no variation, which could be changed with mods and of course be changed with later patches. But for now, I would say leave the United States alone because it's got its limitations historically and mechanically. Anyway, I'll leave you to it, boys and girls. 
I'll uh, see you all later and uh, have a good one. Adieu.